Okay, so we're going to uh, get started here now, um, and uh, we're going to give the lecture. Can we have the uh, Can we have the first slide, please? Okay, we're going to start off with a video. Can you just click on that link for me, please? Click on that link. All right. Okay. Okay, we need to do that the easy steps. Okay. I'm just going to They don't have Wow. All right. Okay, well, all right, no video. Okay, all right, well, no video. Okay, keep going. Go back. All right, okay. All right, well, you know, uh, we have this thing. Uh, I'm just going to put the mic down there. We have this thing called annual reviews, okay? And I was kind of shocked, but apparently I'm supposed to give some kind of lecture which surprised me as a university professor that I would have to do this, but uh, the good thing is it's the education part, so I only apparently have to give one lecture a year, and uh, this is it. I'm not particularly happy about being here. I know you aren't. Uh, I'm only here so uh, Dr. Meneer gives me a letter and I cross off that box, all right? So it, it's going to be a little painful. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to start with some background. Keep going. Occupational health. Occupational health deals with all aspects of health and safety in the workplace and has a strong focus on primary prevention of hazards. The health of the workers has several determinants, including risk factors at the workplace leading to cancers, accidents, musculoskeletal diseases, respiratory diseases, hearing loss, circulatory diseases, stress-related disorders, and communicable diseases, and others, according to Dr. Who. Next slide, please. This is the family doctor. Family doctor, pharmacy, doctor, I don't know why that pharmacy, okay, never mind the pharmacy, okay? Whoa, okay, so that, that got a little cut off. It's supposed to be, that's probably his fault, because it's, all right. Everyone should care about something. The doctor, their boss, their assistants, the patients, the doctors, community leaders, business people, families. So let's talk about occupational health and family doctors. We can all work together. All right. So the data lover. I understand we have some remote sites, so I'm going to go over here. Uh, data lover. Go ahead. The ailing U.S. healthcare system. Uh, we're going to show some data about the U.S. healthcare system. Uh, whoa, no, go back, go back, go back. Okay. It's hard to read that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what? Look, I told you, did I not tell you this morning I'm giving a lecture to some, I'm giving lecture to some medical students. I told you that. I swear to God I told you that. We, look, we're not talking about this now. I'm in front of a bunch of medical students giving a lecture, okay? We'll talk about, we'll talk about it later. Okay, <laughs> so there, there are words here, but you, you know, it's, I can't read them. I don't know what, what happened there, okay? All right, so here's some recent data from 1997. <laughs> uh, 
healthcare spending per capita, you can see a contrast between different countries. Uh, Jillian, next slide, please. Infant mortality, some data for you here. Uh, okay, next slide. Hospital inpatient days. Uh, you like how it goes up? Okay, here's, whoa, no, 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 back, back. Okay, do that slower. Okay, go ahead. All right. You like that? Now, it, the font, but that's, and of course, this has changed now because of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, but this was the situation about 10 years ago. Um, all right. Uh, next slide. Who are the uninsured? Keep going. Okay, some more data here. Uh, <laughs> this is going to be on your exam. Okay. Uh, next slide. This is on the exam. Now this is interesting because if you look over here at these unlabeled axes, um, here the lines kind of all go out. You see that? On these ones here, whatever is being plotted against whatever. But over here, the lines are together. Next slide, please. All right. Uh, some more stuff here, some more data, okay, which uh, this is meters, altitude, all right, next slide, some more data, uh, keep going, look, we're running out of time, go, 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 faster, keep, yeah, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep, yeah, it's all on the exam, but keep going, keep, keep going, keep going, keep going, stop, this is important too, okay, all right, so, all right, next, next slide. You are so lucky to have me here today. <laughs> you, you, you really are. Um, so, before we start my topic, uh, we're going to talk about me. So, uh, this is me. Uh, I got a bachelor's degree from McGill University, Bachelor of Medical Science and a medical degree from the extremely well-known medical school, Memorial University of Newfoundland, which you've all heard of. Uh, Fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, uh, certified scuba diver. Uh, I was chair of the curriculum committee. I was program director for an occupational medicine residency, course director, director IOEH, director of the Global Engagement Office, and overdue for a Nobel Prize. <laughs> Next slide, please. I want to thank some people before we go much further. I want to thank my parents because at many levels, including a biological one, you wouldn't be graced with my presence if it were not for my parents. So let's thank them. My significant other, this person changes every few years for rather obvious reasons. Um, and I also want to acknowledge my pets. Next slide, please. So this is Biffy and uh, Mimi, my two dogs. Okay, so uh, I have this underwater camera and, and, and when you uh, have them go into the water, they, you know, they're, they're jaws. I mean, aren't they cute pets? Don't you really feel glad that you saw a picture of my pets? Next slide. And this is little uh, Fru Fru doing the same thing. It's kind of weird. So uh, this has absolutely nothing to do with my topic, by the way. Okay. So next slide, please. Uh, more acknowledgments. Um, a long list of hapless underlings who really write all my publications while I travel the world, as you'll see. Certainly that may resonate with many of the people in the audience. Uh, but, but really, it's all about me. Next slide, please. So uh, the Europeans uh, wanted to get some uh, feedback and, and, and have you know, be graced with my presence as well, uh, because I am such a big shot. Uh, so you can see that here I am at a meeting of uh, European uh, counterparts and colleagues, and of course, my presence is, is very obvious. Uh, next slide, please. There I am, right there, <laughs> right in the center of things. Okay. Uh, Jillian, you're, you're a little trigger happy there, okay? They, they don't want to be robbed of the European slide prematurely. Next slide, please. Everyone's read this? Okay. Everyone? No. All right. Uh, next, next slide, please. It's a little shocking. Here I am in Saudi Arabia, okay, uh, again, because it has nothing to do with my uh, presentation. Um, this guy looks familiar to me. I, I, I'm thinking his name is Colin or something. Uh, he was very helpful in carrying my luggage on this trip, so that, that was much appreciated. Next slide, please. Uh, this one, you've read this... Uh, Anybody? No? All right. You know, Jillian, you should have 
made sure they did the essential reading. But anyway, okay, we'll move along. Next slide. Uh, here I am back in Europe. I'm drinking some champagne. Uh, again, people are being riveted by my knowledge. Uh, this guy's had a little too much champagne. But anyway, <laughs> next slide, please. This one? Anybody? No? All right, next slide. Here I am on top of Mount Kilimanjaro. Nothing to do with the topic of my lecture. Put it in there. Next slide, please. The uh, next slide, uh, please. Uh, West Virginia uh, has among the uh, highest uh, prevalence uh, in the world. Uh, once obese, uh, limited uh, treatment uh, options. I think you got the point. Next slide, please. <coughs> Next slide, please. All right. So let's talk about everybody's favorite topic, signal transduction pathways. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to focus on this one up here. Okay. So everyone's kind of oriented to this slide and what I'm talking about here. Okay. You can ask me questions at any point. All right. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay, well, here, here's the same signal transduction pathway, and uh, it's a little bit cut off, which is unfortunate because what's cut off is actually essential to understanding this slide. <laughs> so, uh, but for the time being, let's look at up there. You see how WNT through frizzled becomes disheveled. See that? That's signal transduction pathways. Next slide, please. So, uh, I've been spending the last five years studying WNT. As you know, WNT is upregulated through non-calcium dependent ion flux across the cell membrane. There can also be induction by Thomson's loop, which seems to have a negative inhibitory effect on conversion to Prizzled. Next slide, please. My animal model is the New Zealand Lesser Striped Newt. Uh, the question that our lab has been dealing with now is the role of disheveled to GSK3 beta. What we've asked ourselves in our lab is could there be, you ready for it? I'm going to say it, a GSK alpha. <laughs> All right. Just go back, just go back two slides, Janet. Okay, so if you come back here, you can see that when WNT goes to disheveled through frizzled, it then goes to GSK3 beta. And what we're telling you is that there could be a GSK3 alpha. All right, so, okay. All right, so. Here are our results, which show that maybe there's a bypass straight to APC through GSK alpha. All right. Next slide. I am now going to go out of character. So hopefully uh, you appreciated that I was assuming several different personas to illustrate what I regard to be lethal flaws among lecturers that I have heard. So what I want to do now is hopefully model some better behaviors and begin by asking you in a very uh, open-ended way, what were some of the mistakes that you observed that I made? Some subtle and not so subtle. Not all at once. Being on time. Thank you. We start at the beginning. This is the hardest part. I do this lecture a lot. Uh, it is by far the hardest part for me emotionally when I do this lecture because as my dear wife will tell you who's in the back and thankfully played a part in this, um, I like to be early. So it was driving me crazy pacing around my office deliberately making myself late. So message number one, when you are giving a lecture, start exactly on time. None of this waiting five to ten minutes because people are casual about the time. What happens if you allow that 10-minute grace period? 
then everybody thinks the lecture starts at 10 after, and the casually late people who would show up at 10 after are now showing up at quarter after or 20 after, and you're losing valuable contact time. So I'm very clear to my students, I start right on time. And if you're late, you miss material. And they quickly show up on time. Other comments? And if you don't mind raising your hand just so. Raise your hand with other comments. There was, there was some over here. In the back, yes. My outfit? I had to wear this for Justin because, you know, Pittsburgh Penguins, not as good as my Montreal Canadiens. So they, they, but, but truly, th th this is also probably the second hardest part of my lecture because I don't normally dress like this and I get strange looks walking down here um, dressed like this. But my, my outfit is distracting and it's unprofessional. And it's detracting from the message that I'm trying to give you. Other comments? Um, to know your audience, you thought you were speaking to a group of medical students? Exactly. Know your audience. And, and that's important in terms of pitching it at the right level and making sure that you get something out of it. Thank you. Make sure you know your audience. Yes? Showing up with material that Correct. I used to do, when I, when I gave previous versions of this lecture, I would throw out the zip disk. Then I realized I better stop doing that because they don't make them anymore, so I would, I would lose an important prop. But you should be extremely prepared for your lecture. You should always have backup modalities in case anything goes wrong. So you should know your room, know where you're going, make sure everything is, is set up well in advance, that you understand the technology. And overall, as we'll talk about, I think the, the risk that we run is getting overboard with this wonderful technology that we have. You really want to be judicious in your use of technology. And don't try these things for the first time in front of a large lecture. So you found them hard to read, the slides, really? So slides difficult to read. Again, with PowerPoint, less is more. I find animations, you know, all the information dropping in and, and sound effects, I find that to be very distracting. And I'd encourage you to use a very simple approach when you're designing your PowerPoint slides. Your phone was on silent and you answered it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Phone was not on silent. And you might also want to remind the members of the audience of that as well, because that's distracting if it goes off amongst pe uh, people in the audience. So everybody put their phasers on stun during a lecture. Read directly off your slide. Painful, isn't it? Painful when someone just reads off the slide. So the, the way that I use PowerPoint is that PowerPoint are my, my speaking notes. It contains the essential information to make sure that I stay on track. But do not try and put everything that you want to communicate in your PowerPoint slides. And certainly don't ever read them. It is painful. But I have had experience of people reading out from books in, in, in front of large group lectures. This is painful for the participants. I gave you a lot of material, so keep going. We had a lot of pregnant the Wizard of Oz. Anybody familiar with Toastmasters? Anybody active in Yeah. So I borrowed that from Toastmasters. And another key message for you is that I was the Wizard of Oz. I was. I gave a Medicine Grand Rounds, and Dick Imarino came up to me afterwards. Many of you may know him. And he said, that was a great lecture, but do you realize how many times you said, ah, and you should go to the Toastmasters, because the Toastmasters have someone called the Wizard of Oz, who sits in the back, and when you're giving your public speech, is recording how many times you use those nonsense words. And so I had to deliberately stop using those words. It took some effort, but I hope you'll appreciate that I'm not doing that anymore. But it's a constant process. After I got rid of saying Oz all the time, I discovered another speech habit that I have, or had, which was every time I'd show a new slide, the first word out of my mouth would be, OK. <laughs> OK, here's a case control study. Now, what is the best way to become aware of these habits that you have? Listen to yourself. And so I would strongly encourage you 
to at least once a year, if you do this regularly, and I lecture regularly, I still once a year listen to myself to make sure I understand what I sound like. Not the substance so much, but just the way that I deliver the material. And it is, com you are completely oblivious when you're giving the lecture extemporaneously. So people are unaware of these speech flaws, but when it's recorded and played back to them, you cringe. But you can teach yourself not to do it. Other, I gave you loads of material, so. The spelling and grammar errors. Spelling and grammar errors. I'm a man born 100 years too late. I am a meticulous speller. Anybody seen the movie A Beautiful Mind? And, and when words lit up for him, I drive along, it's like that on billboards. Spelling mistakes just light up in newspapers. Occasionally, the Dominion Post will make a grammatical or spelling error, and it just lights up to me. I've discovered that this just irritates people when you're correcting their spelling mistakes. Nobody likes this. But it's, it's very distracting from the lecture, it takes away from your messages, and, and do proofread and make sure everything is spelt correctly and is grammatically correct. You can say your content seems very biased to one point of view. Content seemed to be Bias to one point of view, absolutely. Um, so uh, there was a lot of information there. It was unclear what the information was all about. The context. Um, are you talking about all that well, disheveled and? Yeah, and you referenced the articles have you prepared to come, and it was always you know the one author that kind of thing. Which was me. So uh, <laughs> that's a, a pet peeve. That was one of the more recent personas that I added because. How many times have you sat through a lecture where the lecturer is showing off? The lecturer is there to impress you. And oftentimes that means that the, the material is pitched above what the audience can know because you want to see how smart I am. I'm going to do that by almost talking above you. And the lecture is not about showing off. The lecture is not about talking over the heads of your participants. <coughs> Lecturing should be a humbling experience for you. Your job is to make this information accessible to anybody. And I teach biostatistics and epidemiology. Everybody's favorite topic, right? <laughs> and, you know, I, so the struggle that I have is that, of course, people in medical school went to medical school because they wanted to do triple organ transplantations and save people in the ED. And the, the message that I'm giving them is a very difficult one, combined with biostats and epi, which is generally perceived to be pretty dry. Um, but one of the goals that we try and do is make it accessible. Why should you care about this topic? And why is this important to you? And how do I simplify it so that you can understand it? So teaching should be about serving your students, not impressing your students. You're breathing into the microphone. Breathing into the microphone. Did you like that? And so the microphone went from being way up too high to way far too down. Um, and again, I'm oblivious to you. And, and that is a broader point. I had my back to you for significant periods of time. I was completely oblivious to you. Had you asked a question, I would have completely ignored you. Okay. There was a raised arm. So the microphone. There's more, we're getting into more subtle terrain, Luis. Um, I'm curious about your use of pictures that had nothing to do with the question. Just to say that sometimes when I'm changing my, my theme, I will put a picture of something and do it. I'm just curious with your comment that it has nothing to do with this lecture. What do you think? Correct. And I have to give full disclosure here because there can be a role for those pictures. And in fact, the picture of me on top of Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, which is where I proposed to my wife, is used in my medical school class. And the reason I insert it there is, it's, it's a long, complex story, but it illustrates what I'm talking about in my communicable disease epidemiology lecture and foodborne illnesses. Okay? So I think it's fine to use those photographs as long as it's used judiciously. But I have seen where that's, it, it's not about the lecture, it's not about a little break in the lecture, it's about the narcissist personality disorder, or trait. There's some more, go ahead. Having too much information for PowerPoint, the USF is eating through. Models. Too much information burning through those slides. The, the medical students usually keep a tally of 
who tried to get through the highest number of PowerPoint slides in, in one hour, you know, and it's an astronomical number. It's, it's like 175 or 200 or something. You know, come on, seriously. You know how much time you have. You should be able to have a lecture that not only starts on time, but finishes on time and goes at a reasonable pace. And that joke that I made about it's all on the exam, that's what the students are often told in medical school, right? Medical students, right? Yeah. So, y y you know, they're going through that and, you know, what, what an experience. You didn't seem to know that your health was like Correct. <laughs> they all had J's in them, right? But uh, uh, didn't know who my help was. I want to make another point, which is th the persona that I tried to add here with the signal, you know, so Julie wanted me to add stuff about signal transduction pathways, right? Which I know nothing about. Um, but what I was trying to do for this audience was to talk about basic science concepts. And you'll note that I talked completely over your head. Uh, you had no idea what I was talking about. I assumed a level of knowledge that you didn't have. And who cares, right? I mean, based on what I told you, who cares about all of this work? And so I failed to connect the importance of the material. And I'm going to pick on somebody else here because, in my experience, one of the most talented basic scientists that I've ever heard lecture about explaining very complex material, and especially helping me understand why it was so important is Vince Castronova, who's right there. Uh, every time I've listened to one of his lectures, I'm a physician, I'm not a basic scientist, but when he explains complex basic science material, it connects to me because he brings it down to my level. I also tell the medical students, talk about humbling experience. I'm going to make a disclosure here that is completely taboo in the culture of, of medical doctors. Are you ready for it? The medical students have heard this before. In my class, I was a slightly below average medical student. <laughs> I said it, right? But you heard me say that when I talked to you, right? So, and I think maybe that's one of the reasons I'm an effective lecturer, because if it's understandable to me, it's going to be understandable to most of the medical students, precisely because I'm so sub-mediocre. Okay? <laughs> so. So with, with complex basic science material, you've been in the lab for years and years and years, and maybe all this frizzled and GSK alpha has gotten you so excited, but please make sure that it's understandable to other people, and especially help them understand why this work is so important. Because what drives me crazy is listening to a basic science lecture. You know, what, what is this all about? All right. Louise? The comment about um, the apathetic lecturer, yeah. So, to me, I love lecturing, and, and, and for a person to say I'm doing this so that I can tick off a box on my annual review. Uh, but, but I have seen some most reluctant lecturers uh, physically dragged in to give the lecture. Yes, you had a comment. just by being mindful of it, being aware. And so listening to it brought it to me, and I had to practice. Uh, I also role model good presenters, so I listen to those brilliant lecturers. And brilliant lecturers will do things like speak slowly. They will speak slowly. They will repeat points. Points will be repeated. <laughs> and they will look at their audience. Notice what I'm doing since I went out of persona. I'm looking at you. So if you're falling asleep, it's hard to fall asleep when someone's looking at you. I can note that Dr. Barnett is on his iPhone right now as we speak. <laughs> but I'm engaging you, and I think that's a key process as well. And you can flick along the television to find excellent examples of speakers. Um, on a Sunday morning, you'll see plenty of them. You don't, you know, regardless of what you think of the message, the delivery is amazing. And so I'd encourage you to look at those individuals and model yourself. Another thing that I do is, my wife said when I was preparing for this a few, I think the last time, you should have been a comedian. That's obviously my, my temperament. But, um, so I make fun of myself. 
That's the only thing you should make jokes about in a large group lecture. Stick to self-deprecating humor, because then you won't run into any problems. Okay? So I only make fun of myself. I also have a curious habit where I can do any kind of accent you want to do. So if you want to do a Scottish accent, it's no problem whatsoever. Or I can do an Australian accent. Now worries, I've got heaps and heaps of accents at my disposal. So I will use them in my lectures. I'll tell little stories to try and, as the students are kind of really flailing, I'll tell humorous stories that are at least connected to the material to keep their attention. So all of those are, are things that are very important. So the use of PowerPoint is basically, the way that I use it, is as speaker's notes for me. One concept that I want to, a question I want to discuss is should lectures be recorded? I believe this one is being recorded, isn't it? God help them for that. But anyway, uh, should lectures be recorded? What are people's thoughts on that? So, interesting, most people are saying yes. Um, in the medical school, when we got started recording lectures, this was highly controversial. And um, I'm sometimes right, sometimes wrong, but never uncertain. And so I said very dogmatically that, that recording lectures does not impact the in-person attendance of lectures. And that was true at least for the first few years, but then as people became comfortable with the technology, it certainly did impact in-person attendance. My view of recording of lectures is I don't mind if I don't physically see the students in front of me. I know that they have to listen to my lecture at some point. It's a hard course. It's a difficult course. And if you don't listen to my lectures, you won't do well on the exam. And whether you listen in your jammies two nights later uh, with your, your, your chai, latte, low-fat, whatever, uh, that's fine with me. Now, some of our older faculty don't agree with that. And there's no right and wrong answer, but some of our other faculty say, you know, I, I booked off clinic to come and lecture these medical students. I'm busy, and I expect them as a sign of professionalism to show up as well. That's fine, too. Completely respect that opinion. Another thing that I'll say, which is a little bit of a dirty secret, is there's, and I'm an, I'm an epidemiologist, so there's something that we call a confounder here, some other variable that, that is impacting these two, and that's the quality of the lecture. If you're listening to The Wizard of Oz, or if you're listening to someone who is reading from their slides, I'm going to give you two ways that you can listen to that lecture. Live, where you just get a grin and bear it all the way through, or at home, where you can pause, rewind, take a break, do whatever you want. Turn up the volume, which are you going to pick? So the, when lectures are recorded, attendance is going to be impacted, and it's going to be relatively more impacted on your poorer quality lectures. What if I'm just not made for the stage? I think we talked about that. I would encourage you to listen to your lectures, try and get into good habits, and model yourself after good public presenters. And as general tips, remember that a lecture is a journey. A lecture is not about showing off. Reinforce important concepts. So I happen to believe that there is a role for large group lectures. I enjoy that methodology or that, that modality. I think it's very helpful. Um, but you have to be mindful of the pitfalls. I think you have to ask yourself, given all of the tools that we have at our disposal for learning, why would we still have a large group lecture? So if you are doing things that could easily be done in other modalities, you shouldn't be giving a large group lecture. If people are drawn to the experience, they say, I, I want to hear this material, I want that, that contact with that person, because, again, we, we like these public speeches. That's a rich part of our culture, and in spite of all the technology, we still want that. But we want it to be of a certain quality. Ensure a connection to the exam. If you're giving a lecture on material that, that participants will be tested on, Make sure that what you're teaching lines up with what you examine them on for a number of reasons, right? And the most important one is, as educators, what do we care about? We care and we agonize over the curriculum. Am I going to talk about the von Higgenblagum Schlickenbogum syndrome? Should I, should I discuss that? Mm -hmm. Which book should I use? 
Should I use Meckelstein's book or should I use Brown and Smith's text? And we worry about our PowerPoints and we agonize over all those things. And what do the students care about? They care about any of that? Not, not particularly. Their overriding concern is performance on examinations. And more importantly, the performance on the next exam chronologically. In other words, if you're teaching um, unimportant topics to medical students, which she does, not as important as public health, <laughs> and her exam is in two weeks and my exam is this Friday, they're ignoring her course in favor of my course. That's just what happens. And that's what I was like as a medical student. So medical students, don't be indignant, but that's exactly what I was like. It's a lot of material, and that's how they perceive the curriculum as a series of hoops that they have to get through. And so your job when giving a lecture is make sure that your students perceive a close alignment between the lecture and what's going to be on the examination. We do that in a couple of ways. One of them is by banning a phrase from our vocabulary. And you want to know what that phrase is? This is not going to be on the exam. Never say that. Never, ever say that. Okay, why would you say that? Especially don't, you know, I, sometimes I hear, you know, the next five slides are not going to be on the exam. I hear people say that. Those of you sitting in the audience when that phrase is said, what do the students do? One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> two notes. Okay, we're back. All right. Okay. So, never say that. Another area that we do is we provide a content outline about one week prior to the examination. We used to call it an exam breakdown and realized that was an unfortunate choice of words. So, <laughs> a content outline for the examination. And we'll tell them, lecture one, this number of questions, lecture two, this number of questions, and sometimes we'll be very specific because there's some material that as an educator, I want them to know. For example, in my area, it's the darn two-by-two two table with sensitivity, specificity, positive, negative, predictive value. Everybody gets tortured with that. So I want my students to know that. And so we're very directional because what they will do is they'll learn the material. And that's what I care about. So I'm using the exam to get them to do what I want them to do, which is care about my curriculum as much as I do. Listen to your own lectures and those of gifted speakers to model yourself. Update your lectures regularly. I've been teaching the same course for 16 years, and my wife can testify to this. I am always fiddling with every single lecture I give. And when I stop changing a lecture that I give, it's time for me to retire and let somebody else do it. Whenever it's not fresh, whenever it's not the latest information, you saw that recent data from 1997, okay, painful. Uh, and so we're constantly using that and trying to have a cutting edge topic each year. Use technology judiciously. So there are many wonderful tools out there. And so one of them is an, is an audience response system. So we have that technology here. It's wonderful. The problem with it though, however, is it considerably adds on to the time to deliver your lecture. So to, to get Interactive feedback on one question is probably going to take about 10 minutes by the time you pose the question, give them some time to read it, answer it, and talk about the results. So what we found is the audience response system is cutting in a lot to our, our precious contact time. But I don't want to completely slam technology. I just urge you to use it very, very judiciously um, and not go overboard with it. And above all, you should engage, entertain, excite your audience. So why should we care about this material? We're sitting here because we're first year medical students and we don't have any choice. And it's on an exam that I have to pass and it's gonna be on USMLE exams, heaven forbid. So that's why they're there, but you want them to leave with a passion for the topic. Why is this so important? So I was particularly encouraged to hear Dr. Clay Marsh, the new VP, the first thing that he talked about was prevention in this state, the importance of prevention. That was music to my ears. But I am very passionate about my content area, and I want that to be instilled on the students. If you're a monotonous speaker, if you don't want to be there, if you're apathetic, the result is they're not going to learn your material. You have to be excited about it so that they can share that excitement. And of course, in addition to starting your lecture on time, keeping a reasonable pace 
throughout the lecture, it is equally important to finish on time rather than sometimes you get a lecture suddenly, I don't know, uh, as I said, a lecture is a journey. You don't want to be in a situation where you have no idea where this started, where you are at any one point in time, and then suddenly it abruptly ends. You say, thank God it ended, but I didn't see that coming. Uh, <laughs> you, ideally, in this journey, you want to know where you are at all points in time with a logical ending with some time for questions. So with that, hopefully this was helpful, and I will open it up to some questions before we finish up. No questions. Thank you very much.